the 20th century was a century of artists becoming more interested in working with technology and in being more engaged in society. You had, of course, the constructivists in Russia, Bauhaus in Germany, and some other um, work with uh, music technology in Germany as well. But really, the story of art and technology in the United States started with Billy Kluger. He was a, uh, Billy Kluger was a, uh, born in Sweden and graduated from the Technikhochschule in, in Stockholm and came to get his PhD at University of California in Berkeley. In 1958, he joined Bell Telephone Laboratories, the premier laboratories for engineering in the United States. But as you can see from this photograph, he also went to New York. He liked to visit his, he liked to go to art exhibitions and visited artists whom he became friends with. In 1960, his Swedish friend, Pontus Hulten, who was head of the Swedish Modern Museum in Stockholm, sent him a letter saying Jean Tingley, the Swiss artist, was coming to New York and wanted some help. Billy met Jean Tingley and said, what do you want? Jean Tingley said, I want bicycle wheels. He had the idea to build a large metamatic drawing machine that not only would make a drawing, but would destroy itself during its performance of the drawing. So Tingley began to build his machine, which you see here, uh, in the garden of the Museum of Modern Art, from material they had gotten from the dumps, the garbage dumps in New Jersey. Not only bicycle wheels, but an old piano and um, other things, an old, an old oil drum, etc. And Billy and his colleagues at Bell Laboratories made a timing device. So 27 thing, seven things would happen during 27 minutes that would bring about the destruction of the machine. A fire would start, smoke would come out of a bathtub, uh, different legs of the machine would collapse. So this would take 27 minutes for the machine to destroy itself. So here you see also the machine in, in progress with the fire. The piano is on fire and the smoke is coming out of the bathtub. Billy enjoyed this collaboration very much and began to think that he could offer the artist a new palette, a new palette of technology. So he began to invite the artist to visit him in Bell Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey. And uh, one day he invited Nam June Pike to visit, and while, while they were in Billy's laboratory, Nam June saw this magnet sitting on the floor, and he was very interested. So Billy gave him the magnet, and Pike was then able to use it together with the TV set to make the first magnet TV. And the dancer, Yvonne Rayner, wanted the sound of her breathing to accompany her dance. So the, Billy's colleagues at Bell Labs built a small FM transmitter that she wore, that she wore on the belt of her costume, and a microphone was attached to her throat. So as, as she danced, the sound of her breathing could be heard. Jasper Johns wanted to have a neon letter in one of his paintings, but he didn't want any wires connecting the painting to the wall. So again, Billy worked with his colleagues at Bell Laboratories to using a car battery and um, other equipment. He could make a portable neon sign. Here you see the R. And then um, there's another painting that has an A. He hoped that Jasper Johns would ask him for a T, but he never did. In 1962, he began to work with Robert Rauschenberg on an idea for a sound sculpture that became to be called Oracle. So the idea was that there, that there are five radio channels coming in and that would come into one of the sculptures and then it would be broadcast to speakers in one of the other sculptures. The sculptures themselves were what Rauschenberg called gifts from the street. As you can see, there's a uh, different ventilation pipes, tires, an old car door, an old window, which Rauschenberg made into sculptures. Andy Warhol began by asking Billy if he could make a floating light bulb. So they went, Billy went back to the laboratory, but um, he and his friends made the calculations, and the battery technology was such in the day you would have to have a bulb as big as a house to have it float. But meantime, he found this material, the heat sealable mylar, and showed it to Andy. Andy said, oh, let's have clouds. So again, they went back to the laboratory to see how to make uh, round curves. This was very early in the 60s. 
and um, have the clouds be able to stand up straight. Meanwhile, Andy just simply folded the material over, heat sealed it, and said, this is a silver cloud. In this photo, as you see Andy Warhol begin, uh, filling the balloons with helium and air at the Stelly Gallery in 1966. And here's an installation shot of the silver clouds at the Castelli Gallery. So it's very interesting, the idea of collaboration that the artist and engineer working together came up with something that's completely different from the first idea. And it, to me, it's very interesting that you begin to have weightless sculpture. The silver clouds, in a sense, are quite radical. John Cage asked Billy for a system in which the movement of the dancers of the first Cunningham Dance Company could affect the sound. So you see here a picture of the performance of Variations 5. Those straight rods are actually capacitance antennas designed by Robert Bowen, one of the inventors of the synthesizer. And at the base of the antenna are electric eyes focused on lights off stage so that as the dancers moved around the stage, broke the beam, it would trigger sounds from the sound sources which you see in the front of, at the bottom of the picture. Um, records, uh, tape recorders, other things. It was also a collaboration with uh, visual artist Dan Vanderbeek, who showed films, and Namjoon Pike, who showed projections of video. In 1966, there came a possibility of doing a larger performance series with artists working with engineers. So 10 artists from New York got together with engineers from Bell Laboratories and began to talk about performances and the use of new technology in the performances. This is the, this is the, one of the first meetings at Robert Rauschenberg's loft where the artists and engineers began to talk together. Of course, the first thing all the artists wanted to do was to float in the air. But of course, this was impossible, and they settled down to have other ideas about what they wanted from their performances. And the engineers began to build systems for the artists. Here you see the test of the team system, which is an FM transmission system that would uh, transmit sound and control signals so that artists could turn on lights, uh, move sound from speaker to speaker, and do different things during their performance. So in October 1966, they moved into the 69th Regiment Armory, a huge space, as you can see. Uh, features were set up, and the artists began to um, rehearse their pieces. It was a very, very popular, people were very interested in what the artists would do. Steve Paxton did a piece, Physical Things, in which he built a very large plastic structure across the floor of the armory that people could walk through. The audience walked through the tunnels, and then when they came out, they were given these small little radios so that as they walked under a net with wire loops, they could hear different sounds coming from the net, and they could compose their own sound experience. Deborah Hay wanted to use uh, remote controlled carts that the dancers could interact with. And here you see her and Olga Adorno practicing with the carts. Here they are on, on the left, moving them in, the carts into the armory, and to the right, Whit Wittenberg is installing the FM transmitter that will control, be used to control the car as Deborah looks on. This is a photo of the, of the performance. The dancers either rode on the carts or walked beside them and did other simple choreographic movements. Another view of the performance. To the right, Robert Rauschenberg was one of the cart controllers working with his friend Deborah Hay on this piece. Alex Hay wanted to have the sound of his different sounds of his body heard as he went about doing a very simple uh, movement, which was laying down these uh, colored cloths on the floor of the armory. So on his back, he had uh, special equipment the, the engineers had built, amplifiers, preamplifiers, transmitters, etc., so that sounds of his body could be transmitted to the speakers. When he was finished laying down the cloths, he sat down and his image was projected on closed circuit television on the screen behind him, and Steve Paxton and Robert Rauschenberg came in and picked up all of the cloths. Lucinda Childs had a contraption called the ground effects machine 
that rode on a cushion of air as part of her piece. And here we see Alex Hay trying it out in one of the rehearsals as Lucinda's band. And here's the ground effects machine in operation in the performance. Lucinda had had the bucket swinging from a trap from a scaffolding in front of a Doppler sonar machine. So that as the as the bucket swung, they created a sound like wind in the forest. David Tudor's piece, Bandonian Factorial, he attached contact mics onto the, the Bandonian, which is a kind of accordion which uh, has bellows on both sides. And here, uh, David and Fred Waldar and Billy Kluver are looking at some of the equipment. And David Tudor is now sitting in the armory with his Bandonian. Fred Waldauer is finishing up the final technical details. David Tudor is playing the Bandonian. And Fred Waldauer here is operating the proportional control system he, that he invented. With the, the light pen will move sound from speaker to speaker. On the right, you see construction into which, into which another conductor, a, a transducer, is attached to the metal and is feeding sound into the object and is also making sound as it moves around the armory on the part. Another view of David's piece. Robert Whitman was interested to use a video projection and here you see a, a, a meeting with one of the television cameras that was available in the day. So Robert Whitman had seven cars drive onto the floor of the armory and they either had a video projector or a film projector. They parked in front of the uh, white screen in the back of the armory and showed, showed images onto the screen. John Cage wanted only sounds that were live or produced at the time for his piece, Variation 7. So we had 10 telephone lines installed at the armory and he called different places around the city, left the, left the phones off the hook and these sounds fed into his composition. Places like uh, the garbage dump, the New York Times press room, uh, the dog holding pound, Terry Riley's cow, turtle tank. This is the performance of Variation 7. He also used the system of electric, electric eyes with uh, the electric eyes pointed to lights at, underneath the table, so as the performers, David Tudor, Lowell Cross, um, moved around, they would trigger other sounds into the composition. It also made for very beautiful lighting. For the second performance, uh, John Cage invited people to come down and stand around the performers so they could see what was, uh, see better what was going on. Yvonne Rayner had the idea of choreographing the dance as it was in progress. She sat on a balcony above the floor of the armory and with walkie-talkie sent instructions to the performers on the floor to move different pieces of, of uh, material from one place to another. Very much a task-based dance. She also had events that were pre-programmed like film and video and things falling from the ceiling. And the dance ended when Steve Paxton, on the right, launched himself on a swing that was hung from the ceiling and swung back and forth until he stopped. For Robert Rauschenberg, the engineers built a set of tennis rackets with, as you can see, the, the a small FM transmitter was in the handle the transducer or contact mic was at the head of the racket so that each time the ball hit the racket there would be a very loud bomb and a light would go out. And here we have Robert Rauschenberg and Robbie Robinson talking to Frank Stella who was going to play tennis with his tennis instructor. So this is the tennis, the tennis game. It slowly got darker and darker until the Army was completely dark. And then a crowd of 500 people came onto the floor of the armory, and they did very, you could only see them with infrared television. There was infrared light and infrared sensitive television cameras. And the audience could only see the crowd on screens hanging above their head. I love this photo. It's the photo of the flashlights 
that they used to signal to the crowd on the floor the different activities they were to do, like take off their jacket, put their jacket on, wave a white handkerchief, sing a song. So each of the flashlights was a, a code for something to do. For his second performance, Rauschenberg added a piece in which he put Simone Forti in a sack and carried her around the armory floor as she sang a Tuscan love song. Here's the photograph of the artists and engineers in front of the armory. So during the preparations for nine evenings, Billy Kluver and Fred Waldauer, together with Robert Rauschenberg and Robert Whitman, wanted to continue this idea of collaboration, make this available to more artists. So they decided to form a foundation called Experiments in Art and Technology. And here is the letter that they sent to many artists in New York asking them if they'd like to come to a meeting about this idea. This is a photo of the meeting at the Broadway Central Hotel. More than 300 artists showed up, and more than 70 already had requests for technical help. So experiments in art and technology, but technology was launched, and we began to do such events as publish a newsletter for artists and engineers, EAT News. The most important thing in the early days was that was to um, interest engineers to work with artists. The artists were ready, but the engineers, we had to begin to reach out to engineers. And here is, we had a booth at the convention of the IEEE, International, uh, International Electronic and Electrical Engineer Society. To the right, you see Hans Hacke talking to a prospective engineer about joining EAT. Billy Kluver gave talks at different places about EAT. And we, we organized a series of lectures on technology by engineers for artists in the EAT law. Here, Harry Kogelnik, who worked on lasers at Bell Telephone Laboratories, is giving a lecture on lasers and holography. And EAT began to help artists with, um, with their works. Here we see um, Per Bjorn is watching uh, Marta Manujan, a South American artist who wanted a phone booth. And her phone booth is when you went in and either there was, you would dial a number, you'd get wind or colors, different things happen in her phone booth. It's been here filmed for uh, CBS. Robert Whitman began to work with Eric Rawson at Bell Telephone Laboratories, and they developed a, sculpt a laser sculpture. Robert Rauschenberg worked with Robbie Robinson and Cecil Poker to make sounding. It's a sculpture that reacts to the voice. If you walk in, you see only a mirror, but if you begin to talk, lights light up behind the, behind the mirror, and you begin to see the, the tumbling images of chairs. So we also started an artist matching system. Here you see a very primitive kind of database of information retrieval system called Etnic B key sort card. On one side of the card is the uh, information, the engineer, information about the engineer, and using knitting needles you could uh, retrieve, retrieve the information and give his name to an artist. And on the other side are, is a record of the artists who were given the name of that engineer. We continued this service for artists throughout, throughout the years of EAT. Also to, also to interest engineers, we had a competition where the prize would be given to the engineer for the best contribution to a work of art. We had 160 submissions and we decided to show them all at the Brooklyn Museum. And one of the works shown was the computer nude, one of the first computer generated images. Here's photos of some of the works in the, in the exhibition at Brooklyn Museum. Uh, the work Heart Beats Dust by Jean Dupuy and Ralph Martel is here for the exhibition. And if you were here yesterday, you saw a demonstration of Fakir at three quarter time, which also won a prize. The next project which EAT undertook was to build, to design and build a pavilion for Expo 70 in Osaka, Japan. So we were given the dome, and the artists, the four artists who were the Four artists 
Forrest Myers, Robert Breer, Robert Whitman, and David Tudor had the idea to make a very rich visual and, and sound environment that people could explore themselves, sort of an anti-Disney idea. Robert Breer designed what he called floats. You'll see one here in the exhibition that moved very slowly around the plaza of the, of the pavilion. He said he got the idea from seeing the uh, gardens in Kyoto, the rock gardens in Kyoto, and then began to have the idea that the rocks could move very slowly. Actually, the artist did not really like the dome, and they wanted to cover it. They wanted to cover it with fog, but um, some chemical ways of making fog would be very dangerous, or bring every carbon dioxide. Carbon monoxide would bring every mosquito in Japan billions. So they decided they needed to have pure water fog, and they met Fujiko Nakaya, a, a, an artist whose father had been a great snow scientist. She was experimenting with small fog sculptures, and so Billy said, do you want to make fog for the pavilion? She said, yes. And she found an engineer, Tom Lee, in Pasadena, who was working with a nozzle system that would make fog. So here you see the picture, Fujiko's picture, the first time we turned on the system, completely filled, uh, hid the pavilion. But uh, although we could run the fog most of the time, we could not have as much fog during the during Expo because the, the hat shops and the souvenir shops nearby would get rained on. Here's a view of the pavilion at night with Forrest Meyer's sculpture called Tilted Light Frame. As you see, the, the beams from the tall towers are making a square that cuts through the fog and surrounds the dome of the pavilion. The entrance of the pavilion was a tunnel, which led to a, a dark room, which we call the clam room. Um, and people walked through a shower of laser light, a moving laser light. With, it, the, the, the patterns were made by sounds that they could not hear, and the, uh, the whole laser system was David Tudor and Lowell Cross did the system of laser projection. Then the visitor came up into the main space of the pavilion, which was a mirror dome. The whole room was a 90-foot diameter spherical mirror, which created what is called a real image, it's like a, whole, a natural hologram. And you see here the whole image of the floor hangs in space above people's heads. Here's the same photograph upside down, so you can see how three-dimensional the image also, the floor, the floor was made up of different materials, wood, gravel, tile, etc. And each, of the, each part of the floor had its own sound coming out of it. And each visitor was given this quite primitive handset. So again, as they walked around the floor of the pavilion, they could, uh, they could uh, compose their own sound experience. This is a, a rehearsal for a performance that Remy Charlotte did for the opening. Artist Remy Charlotte did for an opening with silk cloths. As they went up, in reality, the image would go down. Here again is a ritual photograph of all the artists and engineers who worked on the pavilion. As we, as we had worked in a, the pavilion was in a sense, uh, although the, it was, had art pieces in it, it was in an environment that was not about art. It was about a world's fair. And so we began, Billy Kluver and Bob Whitman in particular began to be very interested in the idea of projects outside art. Projects, interdisciplinary, convergent projects that the artists could be part of that would address other areas of society. And we use the image of the rainforest, you see here, this is a rainforest, because it's the idea it's not fixed, that the, that the strength of a rainforest is, is in its activity in the renewal, constant renewal, constant activity. So this idea of, of activity and renewal and going forward was the image we wanted for the idea of projects outside art. One of the first projects was, uh, was a project in India. Uh, the uh, head of the Atomic Energy Commission, Vikram Sarabhai, invited us to come to, do, to, to investigate how to make educational software 
to be shown over the satellite, which was going to be lent to India for one year. So you could broadcast, uh, you could broadcast educational programs into the villages directly. We put together a group of educators, and engineers, and artists, and uh, EAT staff to go to India and work on a pilot project. Here's a photo in, uh, in the Hotel Delhi. And we chose an area the, in the Anna region of India where the women kept the buffaloes. And there was something like, and the milk was delivered to a dairy so that we began to see how could you make, how could you use, at this point we decided half inch video to make visual research notes that could then be taken back to the studio and make educational programs that, that use the idiom of the people, not have someone from BBC in London think how you can make a, a program for the Indian. But the, the images would come from the villages themselves. We were not involved in the implementation of the project, but it was launched in 1975. Another project was called Children in Communication. Which was um, in which two centers connected by telephone lines were set up in New York City with uh, different terminal equipment, telephone, telex, facsimile, something called electro rider. And children could come to the center and communicate with each other using the equipment. It's very interesting that actually this, we did this project in 1971, which was the first year that, the, uh, it was the year that the first communication at Stanford University using the idea of the internet uh, took place. But of course, we didn't know anything about it. It was sort of an intuitive idea that you could have these centers or the centers in the school where kids could communicate with kids in other areas without leaving their own neighborhood. It's, it's very well known among architects that sometimes the most interesting projects are the ones that never quite happen. And um, the next project that we proposed for rooftop gardening uh, in 1971, um, it never took place, but it was a very interesting collaboration with the University of Arizona to do um, this kind of hydroponic rooftop gardening. Just one other that I think is very interesting is a proposal we made for the uh, bicentennial. Uh, the um, American bicentennial was in 19... You know, yeah, 1970, 1976, and uh, this idea is called USA Presents. We wanted to give groups around the country Super 8 cameras, and the kids, people, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, schools, could make, video, make Super 8 films about their life, which would be taken to an uplink and sent to a satellite and broadcast 24 hours a day of these uh, films that the people would make about themselves called USA Presents. So I think you can see from the projects that EAT, it was an organization that was active in a very utopian uh, time in, in America. There was a sense that the individual could begin to have a, lot, a power to shape his or her life. You had SDS, the Students for Democratic Society, you had the protests against the war, you had a lot of activity in the society with a lot of hope for the future. And I think EAT was very much part of that, the idea that the artists and the engineers together could build a better future. And one of the ideas that we had was that by promoting collaboration, you would start the, the process so that EAT would not be necessary in the future, that other institutions, other people would take it over. And I think you see now, as the technology is developed and the education system developed, much more universities and, and, uh, and uh, places, schools, universities are beginning to teach in a disciplinary art and technology. And the, and the kids are growing up with the technology. So you have the possibilities for new forms of collaboration as we move into the future. I hope you enjoyed this short introduction to the exhibition. And I hope you go and enjoy the exhibition. Thank you.